Everybody is somebody's fool. Everybody is somebody's plaything. There's no exception to the rule. Everybody is somebody's fool. Now, I put that up as a jukebox because that song was actually playing on jukeboxes all over the country in the early 60s. It's a lady named Connie Francis who made it most well known. But we're actually having a sock hop at the school this coming week. And so they made the choice for me to DJ that. And so I've been going through all my old wax, right? 50s and 60s records, 45s and all the rest. And this is one of my personal favorites. Everybody's somebody's fool. I've always thought that was a funny phrase. And so the theme and the thought there is that love will make a fool of anyone and everyone every time. And who we fall for and what we fall in love with or who we fall in love with will either make or break our heart. And either way, it'll make us crazy. You'll be crazy if you make a good choice. You'll be crazy if you make a bad choice. And so this song, it's funny to me, it basically says if we fall in love with the right one, we'll be crazy. And if we fall in love with the wrong one, we'll be crazy. If, and, and if we say, again, that we won't fall in love, well, that in itself also is crazy. And so when you think about this, again, the song is basically saying there's no exceptions to the rule. Everyone's going to be a fool here and there. And so the underlying again, idea, again, is that you should make as much as possible the best underlying choice of who you fall in love with. So you think about this, someone uh, who would be a fool right back for you. That's the best choice, right? Just two fools in love. And so whose fool are you is kind of the question for today. Whose fool are you? Because everybody's somebody's fool, and there's no exception to that rule. So people choose, some people choose not to fall for Jesus, not to follow Jesus, not to fall for faith. You know, faith isn't my thing. Um, I, but here's the important thought that I have for you today, which is people just end up being a fool for someone else or something else. I mean, everybody's somebody's fool. And so when you think about that, I was at some point in my life probably a fool for my career. I actually thought my career really mattered. I thought everything in life was whether or not I did or didn't get a certain promotion or if in a meeting I looked stupid or I looked smart or whatever. That was it. That was obsessive to me was I'm going to make something of my life someday. And so I, for a long time, was a fool for Exxon, right? And, and I thought that was going to fulfill me. And you know, also everyone's got them, some phobias, some fears. I was a fool for those things. You'd get off on some little thing that would get in your mind and, and all of a sudden you'd have to spend a bunch of money or spend a bunch of something trying to figure something out. And so I was definitely a fool for thinking that my life could be figured out without God, without an awareness of the one who made me and put me here. And so I just basically made the decision somewhere along the line, I'll follow myself. Now, I don't know if you know this quote, it's from Abraham Lincoln, but I think it's funny too. He said, whoever represents themselves has a fool for a client. Um, he was talking about the courtroom, you know, but a self-appointed lawyer, you know, and you're like, okay, well, uh, you have a really bad client if you're going to be your own representative. And if you're a logical thinker in the room, there are three choices, really. When it comes to who Jesus was, and why he should be followed or why he should be trusted in. And you've probably heard this. It's called the trilemma. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. It, different words are used. Uh, one of the great thinkers in Christianity, which was um, C.S. Lewis, put it liar, lunatic, or Lord. That Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic or he is Lord, right? Uh, I heard somebody else put it bad man, madman, or God man. Those are kind of the choices that you have there. And the reason he was saying that is he said he's, he's either, he know, knew he wasn't God, but he said he was, uh, which makes him a liar, you know, or he thought he was God, and so he said he was, but he really wasn't. He was just a guy who was a little maybe misguided, you know, in, in the way that C.S. Lewis put it, he said he was like a guy who thinks he's a poached egg, but he's really not. But he's maybe harmless, not too, not too bad a guy, but a little misguided, you know, off his meds and all that kind of stuff. And so Jesus claimed, it's very clear in scripture, to be God as a man. And it's not just that it was claimed in the scripture, it's that someone would have to pretty much dismiss all of 
uh, history in a way to not think that Jesus was an important person. There's always these people who come along and say, oh, he's a completely fictionalized character. He didn't even exist. And you go, well, I don't know, man. You'd have to be pretty far-fetched to believe that. So I'd say you'd have to be somebody's fool because uh, all of history radically changed in a hinge right at that moment. And we even reckon our calendar off of this man's life. So he was somebody. He was something, and Jesus claimed, again, over and over to be God as a man, and he was not believed in his day by everyone right away, and that's fair enough. I mean, again, if one of you came to me and said, hey, by the way, don't tell anyone, but I'm God. You go, well, I'm probably not going to tell anyone. I might tell a few people, a doctor or somebody, you know, but, but that's the thing. If Jesus was one of the first two, I'd be a fool to follow him. I mean, let's go ahead and say it. If he was a liar or a lunatic... Man, I have made some very bad choices in my life to follow his teachings, his example, and his way of life. If Jesus was the last one, if he is the Lord, then I'd be a fool not to follow him, right? You get how important this is. And so his claims were way too radical, his actions way too authoritative to to ignore. People couldn't ignore him in his day, and strangely enough, people really can't ignore him in our day. The person of Jesus requires every person to make a decision about the trilemma. Again, who was he? Who is he? Because again, if he was a liar or a lunatic, he is confined to history and he doesn't really matter. But if he is Lord, well, that's in the present tense. He either was a loony or he was a liar or he is God yet today. And so when you think about this, Let's look quickly at the three choices which will be discussed here and keep in mind that song, everybody's somebody's fool. There are some people who think that faith is foolishness. There are others who might say, well, wait a minute, maybe a lack of faith is just as foolish or more so. So you think about a liar, according to this view, what was Jesus? A deceiver, a faker, right? If he was a lunatic, he was a madman. But that important question for us today is who's fool? Are you? I want to give you a quick review before we start verse 6, <clears throat> which is the Pharisees had been made a fool by Jesus, and they didn't like that. Um, they were not used to that. They were the really learned people of their society, right? They were used to being revered for anything that came out of their mouth, and people would basically be almost like intimidated into silence by them because they were just the good people, right? They were the good people and they made everyone else feel bad. So Jesus comes along and he said, nobody's good. In fact, and of all the non-good people, you're the most non-good because you think you're so good. And so he really came to them and, and made fools of them repeatedly and they didn't like it. That's one of the things you got to remember when you try to figure out why it was that, that such a nice guy was crucified. But everybody's somebody's fool, except these guys didn't want to be anybody's fool. And so there's no exception to the rule. Let's look at verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Jesus how they might destroy him. I'm going to stop right there to say the Herodians and Pharisees were not friends prior to this moment. They weren't people who would have really hung out every day, at least not out in the open. They might have had their secret meetings, but they certainly wouldn't have been plotting these things and meeting together until Jesus came on the scene because they wanted to destroy him because, again, he was making a fool of all of them. He was making a fool of the political process. He was making a fool of the um, you know, religious process, if you could call it that. And so they were fools of different things, fools from different schools, but they were all people who said, we got to get rid of this guy. And so Jesus withdrew with his disciples, it says in verse 7, to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan, and from those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. And when they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. And verse 9 says, So Jesus told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For Jesus healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Now, I stopped there in verse 10, and I, I'm hoping that somewhere in a corner of your brain you can keep that question, who's the fool in this story? Who's the biggest fool? Who are the biggest fools in this story? And whose fool am I? Like, again, when you think through it, Jesus was either a liar, as we've talked about, or he was a lunatic, 
And if he was either of those two, people would be fools to follow him. Now, you might just go see a crazy guy just to kind of like see, you know, they didn't have movies in those days. So if there's some super weird whack job somewhere, you might go, well, let's go eat dinner and then go watch that guy, you know, or something like that. And people still do that in these days, right? I mean, you can draw a crowd with that. But if Jesus was God, again, the, the, the truth is it would be very foolish not to follow him. So you kind of wonder, at first of all, who, why is everyone doing what people are doing? Well, in any mixed group, there's always differences of motivation. And who Jesus was to each of those people, of course, he is who he is. But to each one of those people, they had to make a decision too. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this? If he's a liar or a lunatic, again, you'd be a fool to follow him for more than just a short while. But there are different ways to follow Jesus, and I think that's really the meat behind this message. If you're going to really get out of today's scriptures, what, what I'm hoping you will, it's this. There's different ways to follow him. And some of them, I think, are downright foolish. And some of them make a lot of sense. And so if you're going to be a fool, what I would say is, first of all, don't be the kind of fool who wastes their time trying to find fault with Jesus. That's what they call a fool's errand. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, but it basically means I'm going off on something that will never succeed. There's no way I can win if I do this. And oh man, I'd be going on a fool's errand if I did that. I would be wasting my life. Because verse 6 shows some people wasting their life. What were they doing? They were convinced Jesus needed to be gotten rid of. But they followed him anyway. They followed him, but they followed him to find fault with him. And I always find these types of decisions, these kind of directions to be pretty meaningless. I, you know, I don't know what the meaning of your life is, but I know a way to have a meaningless life, which is follow people just to find fault with them. See, I know people who've devoted their entire life to trying to prove that Jesus was a fake. And strangely enough, C.S. Lewis was one of them. I mean, he was a guy who had a tremendous intellect. And at first he was like, this is a bunch of junk. Um, let me as a philosopher, as a thinker, prove Jesus to be false. But in the process of that, he actually tried to find fault with Jesus. He ended up finding fault with himself and no fault with Jesus and said, I think I'll follow him. Good choice. But there are many people who go through their whole life just finding fault with Jesus and anyone who follows after him. Scholarly attempts. And again, if, if you were to say you're going to be somebody's fool, don't be philosophy's fool. I, I followed a lot of philosophy, did a lot of self-help books, tried to figure all this stuff out. You know what? I can tell you it's a fool's errand. Don't devote your life to becoming an expert on someone you think is a liar and a lunatic and trying to disprove them. I mean, that, that was, a, again, what they did. They spent their few little days here on earth trying to prove Jesus didn't come from heaven and had nothing to add to the, to the debate. And so I think about this. In our day, we call them a troll. So don't be a troll. That's what I would say. You know, kids call them trolls. They're people who follow people on social media for the only purpose of saying critical things about them. Like somebody will have a million followers, and I don't know how many it is. Let's say 30% of those exist simply to say, you look terrible in that dress. And you're like... <laughs> Why are you following this person? Do you not have something better to do with your life than follow and find fault? That seems just really like a bad choice. So in this day, Jesus was followed everywhere, but some were the fool of following him to see him fall. That's what they wanted. They wanted to see his faults. So don't follow for faults. That would be my first thought. Then you see Jesus, some thought he was a lunatic, and they tried to talk him out of what he was doing. Um, and, and I think about this, it's interesting because it was ironically his family. You'll see that later in the chapter. But moving on, there were some who believed Jesus was Lord. They really did. They knew he was a guy with the answers. They thought he was a good man. They suspected he might have been more than that. Um, and so whose fool were they? Well, I think this is the part that most directly applies to my life today, your life today, which is that you can divide his followers into two groups. There were the disciples and there were the multitudes. And I think this is really significant because the most foolish to me of all people in this chapter is the choice to follow the crowd without really following Jesus. See, because there were multitudes who were kind of around him everywhere he went and they were attracted to him, but they weren't radically transformed by him. The truth is they were kind of on the fringe, if you could put it that way. 
too cool to be a fool for Jesus. Don't want to be really involved with it, but don't want to be uninvolved either. Um, don't want to be too crazy about him. And so if you look at verse 7, if you can burn this into your brain, Jesus withdrew, it says, with the disciples. With the disciples, and it says a great multitude followed. Now you think about the difference between those two words. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the loud crowd that was kind of, you know, this group of people, multitudes of people, lots, un uncountable people who pretty much didn't think he was a liar or a lunatic. They weren't looking to find fault with him, but they were basically following him for what he could do for them. That was it. It was a self-motivation. When you think about it, the multitude, they told, uh, you know, each other everywhere he went. They're like, where's Jesus today? Well, he's appearing over here. Let's go, you know, and why were they going? Well, free food was one. Jesus even said at one point, hey, you guys never miss a meal, do you? You love, you love the fact that I, I multiply bread and fish, and you think that's pretty cool. You, man, don't miss the miracle. Don't miss your miracle this weekend, stuff like that. And you go, well, there's people at the end of the day. Who can blame a person, really? If you have an ailment, what wouldn't you do to try to fix that? But this is what they were doing. They were going after him for that, mostly physical followers. And then there were the disciples. And I like it because Jesus says, get a little boat because I'm, I'm going to have to make a quick exit because the crowd will crush me. They don't even, not because they're crushing him with love, they're crushing him with give me. You know, the, if I got to kill Jesus to get a part of him, that's fine. They're just, you know, they would be willing to rip him apart. And so, again, it's clearly a distinction between the crowd and the disciples. And to me, again, the most foolish of all possible choices. I can even relate to people who just plain old don't believe. They just don't believe. Okay. Man, be consistent with that. You know, get, rid your life of all things of belief and get on with being a heathen. That's cool. But the ones that I am most troubled by, especially in my own life, is someone who will follow the crowd but not follow Jesus. And so you think about this. Paul called himself a fool for Christ. He said, you know, basically I'd be a moron if this is just a, a movement. If this is a philosophy or one of many truths, he said, I should have picked a better one. This is horrible. I mean, he, you know, he's getting shipwrecked. He's getting, you know, rocks thrown at him. He's getting run out of town everywhere he goes. He says, if for just this life, I believe, man, I made a bad choice. I'm a fool for Christ, though. He says, I, I, I'm actually going to be somebody's fool, and I'm actually pretty crazy about Jesus. See, I think about this. If he's fake, I'd be a fool to follow him. If he's not fake, I'd be a fool to follow him as a fake. Does that make sense? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all to make that decision. And so this is the challenge of the chapter, I think, which is don't settle to be a part of the center circle when you could be part of the inner circle. Now, when I rhyme those things, of course, everyone's a sinner. We get that. The Pharisees were, the lepers were, everyone in this picture was. But Jesus gave people the right. Talk about, I'm going to put it in quotes. Don't think I'm being disrespectful to Jesus. But talk about a foolish choice. He invited people closer to him. I mean, you'll see the kind of people he invited closer to him. So sinners, he was always inviting them into the inner circle, saying, hey, be be close with me. I'd like you to be close with me. And there were people who said, no, 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 no. We, we're going to follow you, but we're going to follow you far. We're going to follow you in the distance. And you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, either love the band or hate the band. But if the band says you want to come backstage and you go, no, I like you guys, but I come to your concert, but I stay way out here. You go, what are you talking about? Either love them or hate them, but don't sort of like them. And so what you see here is fence sitters. I don't think Jesus... Um, you know, even leaves us with that option. Because uh, if you sit on the fence, you've got to fall on one side or the other of the trilemma, right? I mean, it's, he's, is he a liar? Is he crazy? Are you crazy about him? Because when you think about this, they weren't sure they wanted to commit. A disciple is a dedicated learner, one who goes through thick and thin. See, and I love this because you'll see it in verse 8. He says, when they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. They liked the things he was doing. They weren't necessarily as excited about the things he was saying. 
Because you think about it, he had miracles mixed with messages, right? But his miracles always would bring a crowd, but from that crowd, he would sort out people who actually cared about the message more than the miracle. And again, there were many times where he said things like, well, you came for the, the free lunch, but after the free lunch, there's a message, oh, hey, listen, I gotta go. Um, and you're like, mm. See, they were fools for the spectacular. Whose fool are you, man? Are you fool for a miracle? Are you a fool for a message? Because I would rather be a fool for a message than a fool for the miracle. I can get fooled by a trick. I've seen some amazing magic tricks in my life where I'm like, that one was real. I'm telling you, I was in the front row and uh, it was right here and he did it slow and it's still, the, and you're like, you know, people with sleight of hand and everything, they can do stuff. But man, the message of Jesus, when I go home, I, a miracle, eh, okay. But a message that there's meaning in life, that there's something in it. See, there was a competition. There was a me first attitude. You saw it because they would crush him, but they would have crushed each other. They would have pushed people out of the way to get to their miracle, right? Was that a thing that Jesus taught them to do? He taught uh, others first attitude and people were all like, I was here first. I'm in the like, get out of here. You know, he's serving now, serving number 18, you know, and stuff like that. And you go, wow. So that's why I say there's a lot of people who claim that they believe that Jesus is, is Lord, but they don't, we don't, I'll include myself, at times live like it because we don't do what he said. Uh, I, I want him for what I get from him, a crushing crowd. And I can pretty much guarantee that if word got out that everyone who came to Glass House Church next Sunday was going to get $10,000 in a bag, and they would also have all their physical ailments, whatever they might be healed, I suspect we'd have to put out some more chairs, right? There would probably be, if, if people believed it, they'd either say, Scott is a liar, and I don't believe it, or he's crazy, and I might come see a weirdo, but, man, if, if there's something in it for me, I'm there. I am there. I see many multitudes followed Jesus for just that reason. What is the weekly offer? <laughs> What's the offer, right? What, what, what offer are they doing this week? And Jesus did care very deeply about why people followed him. And when I think about this, he did miracles out of compassion. He also did them out of an opportunity to bring a crowd to hear his message. But see, his message was always one of discipleship. Have you noticed that? And he says, if you are just waiting for your ship to come in and hoping God will buy you a boat, he said, I might actually get in the boat and row away right? I'm going to go away from that. I'm not going to be leaning into that because discipleship is what Jesus is all about. And see, when you think about the rest of the book, many who followed Jesus while he was popular rejected him when he wasn't, right? When they saw him starting to get in trouble, they went, you know what? I hear my mama calling. I think I got to get out of here. Um, because when the going got tough for Jesus, they were like, I'm not really crazy about you. I was more crazy about me. I was kind of in love with me. And as long as you were doing things for me, I thought, you know, it was all about that. But Jesus came to call people to a life of selfless service and sacrifice. And that doesn't draw crowds quite as quickly. In fact, it tends to disperse them. See, if Jesus is really Lord, um, he's to be followed. Uh, whether that goes to a, a great and glorious thing. But, you know, for him, remember, he went by way of the cross. So this is an interesting thought out of the mouth of Jesus, Luke 6, 46. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? I mean, call me liar, liar, and don't do what I say. Call me loony bin and don't do what I say. But don't call me Lord and then not do what I say. That doesn't make any sense. You'd be a fool to say that. And so verse 11, look at this. These are some people, <clears throat> our spirits really, calling him Lord, Lord, and not doing what he says, right? It says, unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, fell down before him and cried out saying, you are the son of God. <laughs> but he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. I've often found this a fascinating uh, combo here that Jesus uh, regularly told people, don't tell anyone who I am. Um, and... You know, in, in the theme and thought of today, everybody's somebody's fool. Jesus intentionally came here kind of stealth. I don't know if you've noticed that. 
right? He was born into a little town. He didn't come with a huge announcement, all that kind of stuff. And, and it even says in the scripture that there's nothing about him that would make people immediately go, wow, that guy's tall and good looking and really glows in the dark. He must be God. Um, you know, get, get that guy, you know. In fact, he came as a normal person, right? And in fact, if anything, he was kind of from the other side of the track, so to speak. And so when I think about that, it's an interesting thought because there was a reality show not too long ago. I, I'm not sure if it's still around, but it was called Undercover Boss. I don't know if anybody ever see that. But I actually found that to be a fascinating show because they would take the CEO, right, whoever the CEO of this big multinational was, and they would put them at the entry-level job. They would be like a guy saying, hey, you know, this person got displaced as a worker and they're retraining now. And so they're, you know, they're, they're going to be a line cook, you know, or something like that. And there would be two basic reactions to the person. Um, one is some people would treat them extremely well, right? There'd be the long-term employee training them and patient with them and saying, oh, you know, it takes a while to get it. Don't worry. Stuff like that. And then there were other people who would just go, oh, man, the leadership of this company are just a bunch of idiots. And blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and I, th I think about that and I think, okay, because they didn't know who <clears throat> got me all riled up. <clears throat> because they didn't know who the boss was, they treated him different. And you know what I love about it is in that show, they would often then have the big reveal, right? Where they would say, like, guess what? And people would go, uh-oh. You know, there would be guys who all of a sudden were like, what can I do for you, sir? You know, and stuff like that. And you're like, that's not how you treated them when you thought they were nobody. And so everybody, somebody's fool. <clears throat> People do things for all kinds of reasons. I read a story not too long ago about a young lady who was meth's fool. She gouged her eyes out while on meth. You think of things like that and you say, wow. Um, you know, people say, oh, I'll live my own life. I'll make my own decisions. I, I, I think about this. You know, if all you believe in is even science, I mean, science, that, that's like, you know, but, but if you believe beyond that, I look at things like that and go, well, that's scientific, yes, addiction, everything, I get it. But, man, I also kind of believe in demonic stuff, too. I mean, I look at the scriptures and I go, you know what, not every mental illness or addiction is demonic. In fact, the Bible makes a distinction between the two, but I can tell you, people can be mess fool. I mean, that is crazy. When I think about that, serving self or, or pleasure, or I, I don't know what gets somebody down a certain road, but when you think about this, it talks about demons, and right away some people are like, oh, I don't believe in that supernatural stuff. You don't? I mean, what is it that causes somebody ultimately to go in and, and kill innocent people like crazy? And they go, oh, well... Uh, you know, we're going to look toward the, the plea of insanity. I go, yes, absolutely. It is insane to think that somebody could act in some of the ways people do. But the demons knew Jesus wasn't a liar. They didn't call him liar, liar, pants on fire. They didn't say, hey, you know what? You're just crazy. Don't listen to this guy. What they did is actually said, we know who you are. You're the son of God. And he goes, you know what? I would like that to be a decision that people get to make without the PR of all the supernatural. See, and again, when I think about that, it's an important lesson, not enough to have the facts right. They had the facts right. You're the son of God. You are, you're God as a man. You're, you're not just a normal guy here. And the, the demonic things that came out in collision with him were very dramatic. So you see, verse 13, Jesus went up in the mountain and called those to himself that he wanted, and they came to him. I love this thought right here. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. I don't know how your translation puts it, but that's really amazing. They might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now, this is amazing because verse 13, it says he called those he wanted. Now, some people would love to get into all kinds of theological debate about what that means. For me, I look at it and go, man, that's, that's amazing because... Uh, he, God gets 
to be with people he wants, and you're one of the people he wants. Uh, when you think about a center circle and an inner circle, to think of him saying, hey, yeah, dude, come, come backstage with me. Live close to me. You know, be a part of what I'm doing here. The gospel accounts say of this same situation that Jesus spent all night praying, and you see what he got. He should have probably prayed for a week. Um, he got the 12 disciples. Uh, were they perfect people? No. Were they deeply flawed? Yes. So apparently God doesn't just look around and go, who is, uh, you know, already got it all together. This is an important thought in my life. I think it's important to know that you yourself are wanted. Um, I think one of the most damaging concepts anyone can have is that they're not wanted or is at least that they're not wanted by those that they love right i mean that idea of unrequited love so the the crazy idea that god wants me just changed everything in my life right whoever else does or doesn't want me i don't care but if god wants me that's a pretty big want right he himself wanted them the ones i want these are the ones i want and he picks them out and he was calling them to do something pretty foolish, if you really think about it, which was, he said, follow me fully. Especially that gets played out in their lives. I don't know how it's playing out in your life, but I know how it will and can. Um, you're, if you follow Jesus fully, you'll have some of the greatest, amazing friends you'll ever meet. And you will also have some of the most ridiculous opposition you've ever encountered. Um, for Jesus, it was like, he was saying it's not necessarily going to end well for you or for me. I mean, when he was picking these 11 and 12 out, right, and I do distinguish the 11, they were kind of the dirty dozen, right? And you see, he chose them to be with them. I think this is really important. He says, I'm going to call you to be with me, and then I'm going to send you out to serve. So what is he calling you to do? Well, A, be with him, and then be like him. Those are the two things, to be with him, and to be like him. And again, that's a call that a lot of people go, if they really understand the full implications of it, I'm not sure I really want to do it. From a purely pr practical standpoint, Jesus was crazy, right? Again, I'm not trying to be irreligious, unless I am, which is that he wasn't a normal person, right? He was not a typical person. He was atypical in every sense of the word. He was mistreated. He was misunderstood. It was a thankless thing. Again, people would stand in line all day for him to heal him, but nobody was thinking, is Jesus tired? Nobody had that on their mind. That wasn't what was going through their mind when they were crushing him. They weren't thinking, he looks like he's getting crushed. They were thinking, I need something from you, you know? And, and so when you think about this, to sign up for a following Jesus thing, is kind of crazy. You know, it's, it's, it's to sign up to putting others' needs ahead of your own, others' needs ahead of your own. And if you do that without being with him and try just to be like him, I'm going to be like him, but I'm not going to be with him first, you will find yourself burning out very quickly. Because, you know, you'd be a fool to do this unless Jesus really is Lord. Before he sent the 12 out to service, he sent them to the inner circle. And then he sent them to the outer bands. Do you, do you see how he's doing that? I love it. He's calling them close. So he can send them out, you know, calling them in so he can push them out. And I think about the true basis of any friendship or any relationship. I mean, what if I said, well, I, you know, Lynn, um, I just don't, I just don't want to be around her, right? I don't like being with her. Well, why'd you marry her? I don't know. Um, but I don't really like being around her. And you got the, that would be really weird. Or if I said, well, because of all the stuff she would do for me, that's why I married her. Um, there's people who get married for that reason. You know, oh man, it'll be great. Somebody to cook and clean and all those things. The thing is, Lynn is an amazing cook, but that's not why I married her. You know, and, and if she never cooked another meal again, I like the thought that I'm putting Carissa on the spot, but she wrote a little card to to Lynn, and she, um, part of what she said was, I hope someday to resemble you, um, you know, just to be like you, and, and being with somebody makes them like you, you know, I like you, but I want to be like you, right, but to say, I like you, but I don't want to be anything like you, that, that's kind of weird, 
And so the list of crazies he chose, you'll recognize the names, some of them more than others. Verse 16, Simon to whom he gave the, gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, or something like that, which is sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, verse 18, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house, and the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. Now, again, you think about this. We just kind of read those, and, it, and it no, you notice it just say it. They get, man, they're like getting crushed by the crowd. And Simon... It says that he gave him the name Peter. Simon, his, it, that nickname he gave him means stable, firm, rock, you know, which Peter was anything but when Jesus picked him, right? I mean, you know that. We don't need to spend any more time on that. He, he says to him, you are Peter. I love this because when he's saying it to him, he's, it's not true yet. So you could say, well, see, Jesus is a liar. No, <laughs> he's, he's Lord. He sees the end from the beginning, he looks at Peter and says, you are stable. You're just not stable yet. Um, you're, you're Peter's fool right now, but when you're God's fool, you'll see you will become stable, firm, something that people, other people could look up to. Jesus is also very realistic. He calls James and John the th sons of thunder, and it was, you know, again, very much their nature and and they were explosive they were rash they did not understand the ministry right they were fools of anchor again whose fool are you they were fools of their emotion they were people who were like um you know anger and and all that can make a, a big fool of you but they they said at one point you know the story maybe there were some people who didn't accept Jesus's message right away and they said do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy these people and Jesus says ah, I picked a couple of fools didn't I <laughs> um, yeah I see now I, I it's a good thing I'm not Jesus because I would have told him yeah why don't you go ahead and try you know and watch him out there I, come on down fire from heaven and it's like yeah, it didn't happen you know that would have let him make a fool of himself but he didn't he said you know what guys you need to be with me some more you need to be with me some more so you'll be like me um and so he slows him down and jesus called nine others in this list one was matthew in that list he wrote one of the four gospels he had a tax job he had a good job um and then he went to work with jesus and some people would say that's a foolish choice i know for sure some people thought he was a fool for walking away from the tax booth but he would have been a fool not to wouldn't he see we see it with perspective right he got a job as an author well you can't make money doing that um but he got to be in a best-selling book um, of the Bible, you know? Uh, but the money didn't go to him. Well, no, it didn't, but uh, the ministry did. And so when you look at that, these people would be crazy. Andrew, Peter, Philip, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, you know who they are? Sometimes you don't. That's what's interesting to me. Out of 12 original followers of Jesus, did you know some of them? I couldn't really... As a guy who's been around the Bible a lot, tell you, what exactly did Bartholomew say? You know, maybe a couple quotes here and there. There's no book of Bartholomew. There's no uh, Thaddeus, the, you know, the, turn to Thaddeus chapter 4. There isn't a Thaddeus chapter 4. You know Thomas, what is he known for? Doubting Thomas. <laughs> What a fool. The guy said yes to Jesus, and for all eternity, he's known as the doubter when he really followed him. Do you see how people will pigeonhole somebody for their one big mistake? That guy actually said, my Lord and my God. He actually has one of the strongest statements of deity of Jesus anywhere in the scriptures. And yet people don't go, oh, yeah, faithful Thomas, <laughs> doubting Thomas, man. That's why following the crowd or following followers is just a mistake. It's foolish, man. People's opinions of you don't matter. If the sinners could be part of the inner circle, the sinner circle becomes the inner circle. If he could do it for them, he can do it for me. And so 
one well-known name on the list there, always last. Whenever they list him, he's always last, Judas, the one who betrayed him, the ultimate fool. I, if you want to know, look for the most foolish person in this chapter, I, I got to say it's, it's got to be him. He saw it all from the front row. He actually was close to Jesus and sent out and did stuff. It says they went out two by two and miracles were done. Did you know that miracles were done through Judas? Did you know that messages were brought through Judas? I mean, Judas may have actually had an impact on people, positive impact on people. And so you think about this, you can learn a lot by how Jesus treated Judas. Well, you can learn a lot about human nature by how Judas treated Jesus, but you can learn a lot about divine nature by how Jesus loved Judas. Man, it was almost foolish. It bordered on it. I mean, again, I, I, I hope you understand the respect with which I say the foolishness of Jesus' love to love Judas with abandon, so much so that the inner circle did not recognize him as the betrayer. They didn't say, you know what? It's Judas. When, when he said, one of you will betray, they all said, is it, is it I? Is it me? Is it, is it possible? I, it's me? They didn't all just say, I knew it. And so when you think about that, <clears throat> verse 21, his own people heard about this. Look at it, verse 21. They went out and laid a hold of him and they said, he's out of his mind. His own people, you're going to see, you could write this in your, the margin of your mind or your Bible. It's his family. It's his physical inner circle. They thought he was crazy. The context of the rest of Mark 3 makes it clear that his own people is referring to his mother and his brothers. The people who knew him the best understood him the least until after he resurrected. It's funny to think that Mother Mary, right, uh, really didn't, she knew he was different, but she hadn't made the switch to, he's, this guy isn't just a good boy, he's God as a man, until after his resurrection. It's also true of his brothers. His brothers were like, they don't believe in him, why don't you do this? They were always saying sarcastic things to him and stuff. And upon his resurrection, they said, man, the trilemma has been solved. He is not crazy, he's not a liar, he wasn't just my good older brother, always Mr. Goody Goody. He was Mr. Goddy Goddy. Oh, wow, this makes sense now. See, but it didn't then. Mary and Joseph were just normal people who had normal kids the normal way with the exception of Jesus. And so Joseph not mentioned again in the Bible after Luke 2. He's not mentioned here. Jesus was 12 when he was last mentioned. So most scholars just kind of say, well, Joseph probably had died at this point and just wasn't mentioned. But we're surprised maybe to find out that Jesus had brothers and sisters. But it's more surprising to me to find out. That doesn't surprise me. What surprises me is to find out they didn't believe him. They thought he was crazy. It should really encourage us. They found out about what? They found out about his foolish approach to life. What was his foolish approach to life? Well, he's opposing powerful people. Do you know what powerful people do? They, they crucify people, and that don't get you crucified in this town. Don't, you know, they were worried about the outcome for him because of the way he was living his life. And sometimes there will be people who will be deeply concerned about the practical outcome of your decisions to follow Jesus. I can remember very clearly different junctures in my life where people said, well, that's crazy. You don't have to get that crazy about it. Um, you know, it, it's like you can follow Jesus without getting that wild about it. And you go, well, you know what? If he's really who he said he is and he's telling me to do what he's telling me to do, then it would be crazy not to. It would not be crazy to, it'd be crazy not to. But people will look on into your life and, I mean, I'll just use him as an example because I've watched him from the front row, Dr. J at our school. You would be absolutely crazy to work at that school. How in the world would you devote your life when you could be doing other things to that craziness? Well, because Jesus told him to. And Jesus called him close and sent him out to serve other people. I've seen him serve tirelessly. And I can say that because he's, he's on his way out. So I don't have to like be nice to my boss, right? He's on his way out. But what's interesting is this is a true statement that you'll verify in your own life. On his way out, sometimes there are certain people who once 
they don't have a reason to be nice to you. Sometimes their true colors come out more and you go like, why is that? Well, because everybody's somebody's fool and sometimes people will, because they, of all the political things, they'll do certain things, but as soon as I don't need to be nice to you, I'm just, why would I? And so you think about this, he was being crushed by a crazy schedule, he had a crazy life, he was others oriented. And again, you'd be a fool to do that with the little life you get, unless that's where Jesus says you'll get life. He says, you want to get life? Others. Just the other day in one of the classes, um, you know, the students were, were presented with that thought. And I, I love the fact that Carissa came home talking about it and said, you know what? I think it's just this simple that life doesn't make sense unless you're doing stuff for other people. And it wouldn't make sense to just do stuff for me. It makes sense to use whatever talents and abilities and, and whatever drive I have to do things that end up blessing other people. And I'm like, amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, thank you, teacher, who, who has exampled that also. And so I think about this, they sought to lay hold of him <laughs> you're missing meals, Jesus. It just, it's not right. And they, they sought to lay hold of him. They grab him by the collar. They're trying to grab him and shake some sense into him and say, don't be a fool, Jesus. You only have one life to live and you're only 30. And uh, at this pace, you'll be dead by 33. <laughs> you go, well, yeah. See, you look at him, he's a great guy and all, but this foolishness has got to stop, <laughs> Right. His family wasn't the only one with concerns about his claims. And so the scripture scholars, the, the scrolls with the troll, the trolls with the scrolls, that's what I'm calling them today. Look at them, verse 22. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. Beelzebub means Lord of the flies. It is a reference to Satan. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. So he calls them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom's divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house can't stand. If S Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand. He has an end. I love this because if Jesus was a, a crazy man, he was the smartest crazy man I know. Mm -hmm. Because these scribes, these scholars, these people were logical to a fault. I mean, they were people who figured things out, right? Their philosophy books were full. And so they were a fool, again, of their much learning because there was something they could not accept. And because they couldn't accept it, they had to accept other things that didn't make any sense. And I don't know if you've watched that pattern in life, but again, I've watched very intelligent people accept some really bizarre things because they won't accept that God created this world, created them, and sacrificed himself as an example and as a payment to show this is, I'm paving the way for what real life is. It is to give your life and be a fool for love, you know? That's what it is. Whose fool are you? The scripture scholars? Brilliant idiots. So smart, they outsmarted themselves. And so some of his harshest critics believed his works were real. You see this. They were harsh critics of his, but they, they were too close to it to really just say, well, it's all fake. It's, it's just fables and stuff. They saw the healings. They saw the stuff. They heard the messages. And they saw him casting out demons from possessed people. And they saw people they'd grown up with who were like, out of control and now they were in control and in their right mind and they said well this is crazy it must be demonic it's all they could think when they saw something that they couldn't accept they had to reject it and put it in the column must be wrong must be bad because i don't understand it i don't understand it bad and so when you think about this they saw him with his power but they said we've got to question the source of it I think it's really interesting. The only acceptable thought to them was, he, it must be demonic. He's a demon. He's a, he's, he's a demon throwing out other demons. And you go, that doesn't even make any sense. They were fools of their own logic. He can't be good. He doesn't agree with us. Ever met a person who thinks that way? It's just unthinkable that maybe I'm wrong. It is well, that, obviously, that's not right. So uh, let's see. I, everything I think could be wrong. No, no, can't be that. Must be everyone else is wrong. 
He's not with me, he must be with the devil. And Jesus shows how foolish their argument is. He said, why, why would the head of demons throw out demons? Why would, why would the devil, known for evil, right? That's what D-Evil is his, his DJ name, D-Evil. Um, why would he be getting rid of pain and suffering? This is not what he does. He's healing and helping people. He's freeing people physically and spiritually. He's doing good. Is that what madmen do? If so, may the world have more madmen. <laughs> That's what bad people do. They do good stuff. It makes no sense. He says, if I'm claiming to be God and I do things that only God could do, then you got to choose whether I'm a liar or a lunatic or I'm just exactly who I said I was. And again, everyone, somebody's fool. And they, Jesus goes on to fool them with this thought. I mean, to confound them with it. He, it, it. It's so wise. It's so obvious. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he'll plunder his house. He says, assuredly, I say to you, verse 28, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they may utter. Now, when you think about this, this verse 27, 28, these are really uh, going to require you to think through some stuff. But he, he gives a parable here. He says, all I'm doing is I'm tying up the strong man. I'm a stronger guy tying up the stronger, a strong man. Picture a house being broken into, and there's somebody who has, you know, home invasion, and they have tied you up, Right. And even the police, when they come in, if they're strong, they're going to first, they're not just going to go free you, they're going to neutralize the bad guy, right? I mean, that's what he's saying, basically, is look, God's coming in and he's taking care of something that's stronger than you. So he's stronger than the strong man, but the strong man's stronger than you, right? If you get that little connection. What's he saying? He's saying, I got I to... Gotta, first come in and have them stop being the devil's fool so they can be God's fool. The devil is the strong man in this picture. He's saying he's taking people captive. He's taking people captive. And people are his fool. So you're either God's fool or you're the devil's fool. There's only two choices. And people say, oh, well, I'm not really that bad. And he says, yeah, but you're not that good. Yeah, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And that's one of the lies that come on is, is all of the foolishness that goes on in the, in the world to say, yeah, I'm not the devil's. But if you're not fully God's, you're being fooled again and again and again. People get fooled again and again and again. He says, I'm going to overpower that. The greatest sin is unbelief. Look at verse 28. He says, I tell you, all sins will be forgiven uh, the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they utter, that's a pretty big deal. But he says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. They're subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. This is a passage, I'm not going to pretend to say that I know everything about that. That would be foolish. For me to say, I have the definitive answer on that. And you say, what kind of fool do you think you are? Uh, people have debated this forever, the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's lots of different answers on it. But I can tell you what I believe it means, um, that the only unforgiven sin or unforgivable sin is unbelief. Because belief is what forgives sin, right? If I believe in Jesus, he says, all manner of sins, I'm, I'm, I'm a fool enough to forgive you. But if you're a fool enough to walk away from my offer of forgiveness... There's no offer left. I don't have another offer. I have offered grace. And if you look at grace and go, demonic, you know, Jesus comes and says, I, I have paid for sin. I, here's the gospel. And you go, it's not good news to me. I think it's bad news. I don't believe in it. I don't think we're all sinners. I think we're all winners. We're all naturally good and things like that. And he goes, well, what are you doing? You're disbelieving God's Holy Spirit telling you, I'm holy, you're not. I love you and I've paid for you. You're welcome in my inner circle, but you'd prefer, prefer not to be. Well, turning down his offer repeatedly and pervasively is, in my reading and understanding, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus wasn't a liar. He wasn't a lunatic. 
Um, he's Lord. And the fact that he offers forgiveness is an amazing thought. I mean, why should he? But he does. He's crazy enough to offer it. And I'd be crazy to miss it. And this is what he said. When, when you've missed mercy, what's left? Verse 31, his brothers and mother came to him standing outside. They sent to him calling. <clears throat> and a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, look, your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered and said, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat around him. And he said, here's my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Again, I, I think about that. He's sitting in a circle and he looks at this inner circle, which is really, truly still just a sinner circle, just a group of people who had decided, I want to be with you and I want to be like you, right? He says, you're actually more important to me than that call, my mom's calling. Yeah, well, guess what, mom? Either come close or these are the people who I'm going to spend time with. My brothers are outside so they can criticize me some more. He says, you know what? They'll figure it out. They'll get it. But right now, I would rather talk with this person I just met who is more my brother and sister on this. This is fascinating to me. The brother, physical brother and mother of Jesus, right, are outside the house thinking he's crazy. And he's thinking he'd be crazy to stop doing what he's doing to go be with them instead of with the people who wanted to be with him. Again, you think about that in their society, to tell your mom no was kind of a big deal. It was kind of like, nah, ma, I'll get there. I'll get home. And when you think about this, this means this. This is the thought to leave us with today. Anyone, anywhere, anytime can have a closer relationship with Jesus than his own physical mother did at the point of this passage. If that isn't something to make you go like, really? When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me? Well, I don't know. I don't know, Paul McCartney. Maybe, maybe, and when I find myself in times of trouble, I'll just go be the fool, fool on the hill. And, and I'll, just, I'll just go spend time with him, you know, and be like him. And recognizing Jesus as Lord is, is not a foolish errand. It makes a lot of sense. The craziest people, again, were for me the multitudes. You'll meet people who openly, hostily don't like Christians. I, I actually don't meet that many of them. And I know there's parts of the world where I would, right? But right now, I don't actually openly get a lot of hostility for my Christianity. I don't. And the truth is, I don't. I even get like what I call the passive thing where people, oh man, I'm so happy for you that you got this crutch. That you, you know, have your sort of simpleton mind and you have your little faith. And that's cool that you found something. I'm happy for you. You know, it's not hostile. It's actually sort of condescending and, and, and you know, pandering to you. you. You'll find those because people think he's a liar or he's crazy. But Scott's kind of crazy about that whole faith stuff. But you know what? The people I, I most can't understand is the mixed multitude who kind of believe and kind of don't. The fence writers who say, well, I, I, just, I just hang out here in the fringe. I don't want to be part of the in crowd with Jesus. Because he did go to the cross, and I guess you'd be a fool to do that for somebody. He was my fool. I mean, think about that. He's somebody's fool. He's everybody's fool. Jesus was willing to be crucified on my behalf. So I'd be a fool not to follow a fool like that. Thank you, Lord, for your time that you have given to us, uh, the breath you've given us to enjoy and the brains you've given us to mold through these things. And I pray that the trilemmas of life would be solved with the simple thought that you are Lord and it makes sense to follow you even when it looks foolish. And we pray it in Jesus' name.